there's a tendency if you're going very slow to catch your right pedal on that banking it lifts up your back tire and down you go they'll restart the race but you end up with a little bit of a bruise and uh, lose your nerves sometimes I was about to say, what a story that Nelson Vales has. He came on very strong at 83. He was the Pan American champion. Uh, he was a former messenger in New York City. Uh, grew up in Harlem, uh, rode a bike, uh, trying to make a, a few bucks a week, and uh, uh, delivered the packages faster than anybody else, and thought, well, maybe I'll become a road racer. And uh, did, and now he's, he's become a, a really fine track cyclist he's in one of against one of the best of France in fact the French national sprint champion is Philippe Vernay all right the bell lap and this is where it will happen now you can see Nelson starting to wind it up make sure the speed is fast so that French rider gets a jump it's not going to be that strong of a jump the French riders taking him look at that high on the track look out here because they would like to slingshot in behind Woo! Vernay will go high here on the outside and bails us Fighting him off. Bales is on the pole lane. And Bales pedals hard. He's going to win it. Whoa. Oh, he came right up and looked him in the eye, and Bales said, see you run. French rider tried to come inside. <laughs> the 1984 Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles where he won the silver medal. If you could all uh, welcome us and give a big round of applause to Nelson Bales. The Cheetah, good morning. I met Nelson Bales at, I believe, El Dorado Park. A long time ago, it was um, right after he got the silver medal in the 84 Olympics. It, it was rough being, I can imagine, being a, a black cyclist in a white sport. Um, it's still now, you don't see that many black professional cyclists that even succeed as far as Nelson did. So you can just imagine that the doors were probably not quite as open then as they are now. Nelson never played the race card, never did that. He, I think he thought of himself, he's just a regular old American. He was born here, and that's it. But as far as, as the images of the sport, which a, we were basically a regular white old sport. In the United States, we, they were Major Taylor, who was a great as world as champion back in the 1800s. Marshall Walter Taylor was born in Indianapolis, Indiana on November 26, 1878. Taylor won his first amateur race at the age of 13. In 1899, he reached the top of the cycling world by winning the world title in the one-mile sprint. With that, he became the first African-American world champion in cycling. What made his accomplishments even more impressive was the fact that he was a black man who overcame open racism. He was not allowed to join the League of American Wheelmen, the dominant cycling organization of his day, simply because of his color. While the others were racing for money, Taylor was racing to prove that he was equal of any man. In the projects, uh, the building that we lived in, which is 20 West on 15th Street, there was only two apartments, and I think they made them that way for families, because we were there since they were built, so we were the only family that was in that apartment. Well, back then it was like a village. We were raised by our environment. We had a lot of adults that participated in our education, and they made sure that we did the right thing. Back in that day, kids were out on their own. Me and Nelson hanging out in the streets at eight years old. Playing with our Tonka trucks, digging up the grass, sneaking on subways, writing graffiti. We didn't know any better. That was everybody else what the kids were doing back then. As a kid, he was adventurous. He was um he broke off and did his own thing. Um he wasn't a follower, he was a leader. My mom had him at 45. He, he was just spoiled. He was spoiled. I remember every when he didn't get his way, he used to fall out. Like fall out, bam, and do a little tantrum thing. I was watching TV and my mother would come in there and say, you know that boy watch how they do these at a certain time and then run me out the living room with the TV. As a child, him being the last one, he was very spoiled. Just before he was born, my older brother was murdered. He was 19 years old. He was murdered right on our stoop um, by a gang member. So I guess because of the sadness and mourning, a month later him being born, my mom just, he was the last one, so we just, spoiled him. He was special. There was, that was a time of uh, uh, 
the welfare uh, movement, so there was uh, you know, a lot of joblessness and lack of training, and it was, it was difficult. And back then, there was a big drug era. It was just coming about with the dope and everything. And a lot of kids' parents, they weren't uh, steady-minded enough to, to mold their children to get out. You know, some of them were, like the grandmothers here, which are mostly all gone now, they were old-fashioned enough to teach your kids right, you know, mold your kids into something, make sure they want to be something. We had a lot of hardships, but we didn't know it. I mean, when we look back at it now, we had a lot of hardships. You know, our families, we, 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 we struggled, but we had fun doing it. We didn't realize we were struggling. He made the right choices. I was in sports. His older brother, Ronnie, was in sports. So he took the sports road. And he had talent, a natural talent at a very young age. We had the same skateboard. We skate downhill. He was at the bottom of the hill. I'm still starting at the top. It was just something that him and Speed just went hand in hand. Around that time of me getting into cycling, I was hanging around a motorcycle club called the Black Unicorns. And these were some cool guys. They had nice fancy cars, fancy bikes. And I was thrilled by the motorcycles, but it was right outside Central Park, and that's how I got hooked up into that situation. But one of the motorcycle club members gave me their nice bike, because they weren't riding. It was a Peugeot PX10. I remember that very well. It was a little too big, but it was a Peugeot. It was one of the nicest bikes you can buy then and I rode that bike in Central Park every day and that was my first real racing bike and I did not know what I was doing. And there's no doubt it was really tough for Nelson and, and even tougher because he wasn't becoming a basketball player or a baseball player or something. He was becoming a cyclist. Where they came from, it was, it was a, a tough road. I mean, didn't, no money, didn't have bikes, they had to work, they had to work hard. Nelson uh, did a lot of menial jobs to, to make it into cycling. Well, Nelson, when he was uh, 17 years old, decided he needed to get a job. And I was his first boss. First boss meaning bought him his first bike when he first started. He'd get up at 6 o'clock, 5.30, go to 25 miles, and he would come to work at 8.30. It was a job for him, a legitimate messenger job. And outside of the job, he would actually cycle. And so I would say the job was his training ground. You'd ride your bike around and you'd make 150 bucks for the day at the end of the day. And all you did was ride your bike around. And it was like, and they gave me money for that. I would have raced up 6th Avenue for nothing, you know? You just enjoyed riding the bike. Riding in the streets of New York as a messenger built my confidence of awareness. Just awareness alone. Mind you, this is way before the cell phone, telex machine, I think it was about as good as it got, but everyone used messengers in the city. My awareness and traffic, my surroundings, my surroundings alone, my keen sense of surrounding, just growing up in New York City alone, just knowing what's going on in my peripheral vision, recognizing things. Don't pay attention, but noticing things. Uh, riding in the streets of New York City helped my cycling skills as far as racing in a pack, to be able to avoid crashes, I work my ass off as a messenger. I, I leave the house at eight o'clock on the dot, calling in from the house phone, get my first run, and then have a pocket full of dimes and run it all day till five. For us, a foot and bike, the streets are like, they're pretty mean and we really gotta be alert all the time, you know, cause we're in traffic a lot. You know, a lot of times, you know, there, you, you can see a messenger on the street, you may not know he's a foot messenger, but he, he's a runner. And so he's going in and out of traffic just the same as a bike, but not in the same way. The track race is a mind game. Navigating, knowing when to have that right foot up and down with the press to give you that momentum and push. And the same with jockeying in traffic with the buses and the cars at the stop side. There's no doubt that Nelson's day as a bike messenger and the craziness that you have to go through every day, you know, avoiding cars, avoiding pedestrians, avoiding people crossing the crosswalks and trucks and taxis. That that was great. That was a great training ground for life as a as a top sprinter in the world. He had a talent to ride a bike. Something that everybody learned to do. But his interest in it was peaked, you know, at one time or another, and he took it seriously. Opportunity. 
He had the bikes. They offered these uh, races around Mount Morris Park in Harlem every year. And bicycle riders from all over would come and be a part of this race. And with his talent and his power, he won every year. Uh, it's, his transformation, to me, it seemed like it happened in a, in a beat of an eye. That one minute he was just the guy at the local race, just doing his thing, and then all of a sudden he was in the magazines, or there was an article about him in, in uh, Bellow News or something. All of a sudden he had grown. I quit my job to go live at the Olympic Training Center. So I bust my ass and I worked my ass off to save money because I was leaving to go learn to race my bicycle. I had an invitation to a, a winter training camp. Everybody knows me as a I really know me as a I'm in Polish. guy who don't know how, what to ride a bike. He was very fresh, very muscular, very powerful, and like be really cycling, cyclist. So we start working from that. I have feeling, okay, this guy can be a bike rider, good sprinter. That's only, I bring black guys to sport. Before, you know, was little, you know, not much. My sprinters, was black, that's not only Nelson. The cycling community never really held the color of your skin too much to task anyway. They've always been pretty much accepting of, can you ride a bike? It was seeing this young, colorful, flamboyant, African-American kid that was from New York, and, and, and he had the, this kind of the supporter, the sponsor, Lenny Preheim, who, is a white
We search for meaning in all that surrounds us, while on a quest to find our place. This is the story of those who choose to seek color and live their life in a different way. Love. Love. 
lightning in a bottle, that special place that helps us connect with our core spirit, reminding the world that anything is possible when we come together. Uh, 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. Seconds to say something. To the world. The world. The world. The world. And this is what I have to say. The time is coming. You follow your own bliss. Share your medicine. Share your light. Share your beauty. And we all have something inside of us that's going to bring us to peace, harmony, and love. 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 Love yourself. Love comes from within. Let it spread. All life is total love. That's all I have. Peace and love. Spread it. Spread it. Change is coming. The only constant thing is change. We're changing the world right now. If you feel like you need to do something, do it. Let your heart inform all of your choices. Be yourself. Be kind to your neighbors. Treat others like you wish to be treated. Call your mom. Spend time with your grandparents. Love your children. Be there with your children. Dance. Dance with each other. Dance to music you don't understand. And do it often. The sun will come out tomorrow. Put your bottom dollar. If we hold each other and love each other, we can pass into the new dimension where all is love. It's time for us to evolve, wake up, realize we're all one. Because we're meeting heart to heart, right, baby people? Because we're meeting soul to soul. Soul to soul. Breath to breath. Breath to breath. We're meeting in the center of the universe. We can be even though you give a little taste of this. I will meet you with my heart. I'll meet you with my heart. Heart to heart. Let us meet again. I love everybody and I'm starting to find myself for the first time in my life. Thank you. Smash the funk. Ooh. We live in a world full of infinite beauty. We search for meaning in all that surrounds us.